Alan project. Hi, yeah, I'll uh, share my slides just a second. All right, can everyone see this? I can see them well, yes. Great, uh, so yeah, I'm very excited to be talking to you all today about the Allen project and the work we've been doing to develop a high level trigger on GPUs for LHCB. Oh, gotta learn how to switch slides now. Okay, um, so the, one of the first things you wanna know when you're designing a trigger is uh, what, are, what are the rates of the processes you're interested in studying? And so if you're working at a general purpose detector like Atlas or CMS, you might be interested in something like Higgs production or TT bar production or electroweak bosons. And you can see in this uh, box I've made on the left that uh, these processes uh, will, they, they'll have a trigger rate that maxes out at roughly hundreds of Hertz. And so you can trigger on these efficiently uh, with a trigger that takes about hundred kilohertz and uh, uh, uses single detector systems. So uh, the high ET uh, calorimeter clusters for high energy photons or jets. But at LHCB, we're interested in heavy flavor decays. So we're interested in, for example, BB bar production and CC bar production. Uh, and you can see in this, you can see on this plot that this will exceed uh, one megahertz. And furthermore, the final state particles of these decays have uh, relatively low energy. So they'll have PT of less than or about one GPT. So then how do we trigger on these? Well, uh, heavy flavor uh, hadrons will fly some distance and then decay producing uh, displaced low PT tracks. So our characteristic signal is a displaced ver a secondary vertex. And to do this uh, well, this really requires information from the entire tracking system. And you can kind of see this in this lower left plot here. Um, this, is a, this is the performance of an algorithm that uses just uh, the LHCB HCAL to trigger on hadronic B decays. And uh, if you look at this, if you have a trigger that outputs one megahertz, which is uh, roughly what you'd want, you get an efficiency of around 10%. Um, so this really shows you that you need more information than this to uh, effectively trigger on these decays. And so our solution for this is to read out the full detector uh, at 40 megahertz in run three. So this means we have to redesign our trigger uh, between run two and run three. So run, on the left is the LHCB trigger from run two. Um, there's a 40 megahertz bunch crossing rate, which goes to a hardware level trigger, which outputs one megahertz, which goes to a two level high level trigger in software. So this is split into HLT1, which performs a uh, partial event reconstruction and then HLT2, which does a full offline like event reconstruction. But then in run three, which is this diagram on the right, this hardware level trigger is removed. So HLT1 will have to process the full collision rate. Um, and so this is what I'm gonna be focusing on now is this HLT1 step. So why would you want to try this on GPUs? Uh, so GPUs offer more theoretical flops in a compact package. Um, so you can see in this plot on the left that the sort of top end Consumer GPUs like the RTX 2080 Ti uh, offer around three times more flops, three, uh, three to four times more flops on these top end CPUs. And this factor of three to four becomes an order of magnitude when you start to talk about uh, cost, per, cost per theoretical flop, so uh, flops per dollar. Um, and on top of that, many of the HLT1 tasks we're interested in performing are inherently parallel, so we can take advantage of, the, of this increased computing power. Now, I don't wanna give you the false impress, impression that this is not possible on CPU. Um, LHCB, uh, there's been a ton of work to create a viable CPU HLT1 for run three, and uh, Louis gave a very nice talk about that. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, but this brings us to the Allen project. So this is named after Frances E. Allen. She's a famous computer scientist who did a lot of work in compiler optimization and parallelization. 
um, and you can see the institutes involved in this um, in the top right. And this project began in February 2008, and you can find it here on GitLab. Um, and this is a standalone application. So to build and run Allen, you only need C++17 and CUDA 10.2. And we recently had our first publication accepted. You can find the preprint on the archive here. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, the progress we've made since Alan was presented at the last Connecting the Dots in uh, 2019. And so you can see from uh, Brigia's talk there that uh, big parts of the reconstruction sequence weren't finished. And so since then, all of the reconstruction algorithms have been completed and we've added trigger selections and output. Now on top of that, a lot of these uh, reconstruction algorithms have been completely rewritten and giving us huge gains in throughput. And while you won't really be able to see it in any physics plots, a ton of work has gone into improving the scalability and configurability of Allen. Um, and this is work that's really vital to take Allen from a, a sort of prototype to an actual trigger that can run during online data taking. So in summary, we have a complete HLT1 on GPUs. And uh, earlier this winter, Allen was reviewed as a viable option for LHCB's HLT1 in run three. And currently the final technology decision is in progress. So one thing that I wanna emphasize is that Allen is for everyone. And I mean this in two ways. So first of all, Allen isn't just for GPU experts. So on the left, we have uh, the architecture of Allen and there's a lot of stuff going on here, but really uh, all of this kind of hides the tricky parts of working with CUDA from new developers. So a new developer can jump straight into working on just the algorithms here. Um, and furthermore, this can be compiled for both CPUs and GPUs. So you don't even need a GPU to start contributing to this project. So this accessibility is reflected in the fact that most of the roughly 15 developers on Allen are students. Um, and some of these are even undergrads who have made uh, real contributions and on timescales of months and not years. And I also mean that Allen isn't just for LHCB. So really the only uh, LHC specific part of Allen are these uh, reconstruction algorithms. And those could be replaced uh, with non LHCB algorithms. So Allen could serve as a platform in the future for other high throughput applications. So what does Allen need to do for HLT1 on LHCB? So this is on the left, a diagram of the upgraded LHCB detector. Um, HLT1 uses uh, primarily four tracking systems. So there's the VELO, the vertex locator, uh, highlighted in red here. Uh, there's the upstream, upstream tracker, the UT, um, and then uh, the magnet, and then the sci-fi tracker, the uh, scintillating fiber tracker, and the muon stations. So Allen needs to decode data from these sub-detectors, and it needs to cluster this into hits in the uh, detector coordinate system. And then it needs to build tracks, and from those tracks find primary vertices, so the actual impact points, and uh, match the tracks to muon hits to identify muons and then fit tracks with a fast common filter to improve the track description close to the beam line, and then make two track secondary vertices, and finally uh, use all of those ingredients to perform trigger selection. So let's start with the VELO detector. Uh, the VELO is a 26 layer silicon pixel detector close to the interaction region. Uh, it's, it provides crucial information for primary and secondary vertex finding. Uh, it's, uh, it pulls away from the uh, interaction point when beams are unstable and it comes towards it when they are. Um, and so the first step, uh, first step in, this, in reconstructing the uh, data from the VELO is to cluster it. And this is one area where the GPU can really shine. Uh, so we use this mass clustering algorithm to where we start with a seed pixel um, and use a bit mask to add pixels to the cluster iteratively until no more pixels can be added. And this allows us to cluster in constant time. And then once we have hits, we can, uh, we can 
take advantage of the fact that uh, tracks originate from the beam line and use and sort these hits in phi and uh, search for uh, search for triplets using phi windows. Um, so the uh, so we search for triplets and then we forward those triplets to the next Velo module and then we search for triplets in that module and we do this until we have uh, done this on the entire uh, Velo detector. And this is documented in more detail in this paper I've, uh, I've I have below here. And you can see the efficiency of this algorithm on the bottom left. So after we find Velo tracks, we, uh, we can look for primary vertices using those tracks. And so we do this using a histogram method. Uh, we histogram the point closest to the beam line of the Z position of the point closest to the beam line for each of the Velo tracks. Um, and then uh, our primary vertices are peaks in this distribution. And you can see a very nice talk uh, from Florian about this. And also there's uh, uh, a lot of work going into uh, developing new methods for this. So you can see Marion's talk on a deep learning approach to this. Um, and then you can see the performance of this algorithm in Allen in the top right. So once we have Velo tracks, we can forward these to the UT. So this is a four layer silicon strip detector. So we use the extrapolated Velo tracks to open search regions on the first layer of the UT. And then we uh, fit this to, or we uh, create three or four hit uh, UT track candidates. And so the UT has, a, there's a small magnetic field in this region. So this gives us our first momentum estimate of the tracks. And this allows us to uh, have some idea of where we need to extrapolate on the sci-fi. And this algorithm is detailed in this paper below too. So once we have UT tracks, we can uh, propagate our tracks through the magnetic field to the sci-fi. This is a 12 layer scintillating fiber detector. And you can see the layout of it in the top left. And we do a uh, triplet search on what are called the X layers. Um, and we reconstruct tracks with P greater than three GeV. And this is because this is the uh, minimum momentum required for us to do muon ID. Lower momentum tracks won't reach the muon stations. Um, but there's no PT requirement for these tracks. So in the past, uh, LHCB's HLT1 has uh, made a PT threshold, ha has a tracking PT threshold of 500 MeV. And this is to limit the search region on the sci-fi. But the Allen sci-fi uh, algorithm actually doesn't need to make this assumption. And so this could potentially allow us to expand LHCB's physics program, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so this also gives us a very good momentum estimate. You can see in the lower left plot, uh, we get a momentum resolution of about 1% over the entire region we're interested in. Um, and so this is uh, perfectly adequate for performing the physics selections we want to perform in HLT1. So next, after we have uh, forward tracks, we can propagate these to the muon chambers and match those tracks to muon hits. Um, so Allen uses roughly the same algorithm that's been used since run one at LHCB. Um, and you can see the linked paper for more information. Um, in summary, uh, higher momentum tracks require more hits in the muon stations, and this gives us uh, consistent performance over a long range and momentum. So these, uh, these complete tracks can then be Coleman filtered. Um, so as I mentioned, we already have a good momentum estimate, and propagating through the magnetic field with a Coleman filter takes a long time. So we've implemented a fast Velo only Coleman filter. So this, will, this we can use to improve the track description at the position closest to the beam line. Um, and so you can kind of see the power of this. We have uh, two, uh, two Coleman filters demonstrated in this plot on the left where we take two selections and we vary the rate uh, using, using the impact parameter uh, requirement for each of these selections. 
And uh, the, one of these Coleman filters, the simple Coleman filter uses no momentum information and the other uses momentum from the forward tracking uh, to uh, parameterize the uh, noise contribution from multiple scattering. And you can see that the, uh, the parameterized Coleman filter gives us better efficiencies at around the same rate. And so this, this better description of the track gives us better impact parameter resolution. As a consequence, it allows us to better discriminate between prompt and displaced tracks. And because this is only in the VELO, this is a very fast Coleman filter. Well, so Coleman filtering is typically a very time consuming part of uh, the reconstruction. This takes uh, less than 1% of the total sequence time. So now we have all the ingredients we need to perform trigger selections. Uh, so we've uh, put together five trigger selections that cover most of the LHCB physics program. Uh, and so these are, uh, these selections are based on one and two track candidates that we've reconstructed. And uh, so you can see on the left, we tuned this to have a total output of around one megahertz, which is uh, roughly what we want from HLT1. Um, and then on the, this bottom, uh, this bottom table, we have examples of some, uh, some decays we're interested in and efficiencies that we get. There are a number of categories here, but I think the most important is probably this GEC times TOS on the rightmost column. So these are events that pass a global event cut and are trigger on signals. So that means that the trigger candidate is matched to the true, uh, the true decay uh, products uh, in Monte Carlo. And so these are closest to what you would wanna use in actual physics analysis. And you can see here that uh, we're, we're getting uh, much higher efficiencies than the 10% or so that would be, we would get from a hardware-based trigger. So you can really start to see the power of this software-only strategy here. And while we've only shown five selections here, uh, Alan can handle uh, up to 100 selections with minimal impact on throughput, or order 100 selections uh, with minimal impact on throughput. So how does Allen perform? Uh, can handle, from this plot on the left, you can see that it can handle the full 30 megahertz collision rates uh, with fewer than 500 RTX 2080 Ti GPUs. And these are sort of our reference card that we're using. Uh, and these are GPUs from 2018, so they're already almost out of date. Um, and also this throughput is approaching the numbers that we quoted at Connecting the Dots 2019. Uh, but those are missing big parts of the sequence. Uh, a few reconstruction algorithms, the sci-fi tracking, the muon systems, the, the Coleman filter, and they made no trigger selections. And also you can see that this throughput scales well with theoretical teraflops. So uh, as GPUs improve, uh, Allen will continue to improve. Um, and also you can see that Allen scales well with generational improvements. So for example, this Tesla T4 here is a, a different generation card and uh, as a result has better performance for teraflop than uh, older cards. Um, so Allen will make use of both incremental and generational improvements in GPU performance. So now I wanna take some time to talk about uh, some things we're thinking about and working on now um, and one of those is triggering on multi-track vertices. And so by that, I mean three or four track vertices. So currently HLT1 only triggers on one and two track candidates. Um, this is true of the CPU implementation and the past implementations of HLT1 and runs one and two. Uh, but Allen can reconstruct forward tracks with no PT requirement. Um, and so this means that three and four track vertices become viable because uh, if you have a B decay, the probability that one of your uh, final state particles has PT below 500 MeV is really high. Um, but with no tracking threshold, uh, suddenly this is, you can do this efficiently. Um, and so you can see on the left, this is the plot that I showed to demonstrate the Coleman filter, but it also sort of shows uh, what we can do with one and two track selections versus uh, 
this plot on the right, which is a plot demonstrating the performance of the LHCB topological trigger. This is a uh, machine learning algorithm built for run, uh, built for HLT2 in run one that, uh, that uses, uh, they, triggers on two, three, and four track candidates. And so you can see that they both top out for the same physics channel as BS to Phi Phi uh, at around 80% efficiency. Um, but the topo rate, uh, uh, but the topological trigger takes a much lower rate than the, uh, than the one or two track triggers. Um, so this gives us hope that we can, uh, we can uh, explore new, tr totally new trigger strategies um, and see big gains in performance. Another thing that we'd like to do is calorimeter clustering. Uh, so typically in HLT1, we haven't done this because uh, clustering is really hard, uh, but it's kind of the perfect task for GPUs as you've seen with the VELO. Uh, and this would allow us to do electron identification in HLT1. So a lot of really interesting LHCB analyses uh, rely on electrons. So for example, RK star, which uh, compares final states with electrons to final states with muons. Uh, we have dedicated muon triggers for this, but we have no dedicated electron triggers. So this would be nice to have, uh, and it would really, this analysis would really benefit from it. And then uh, LHCB has recently started to contribute to dark photon searches. And this bottom right plot is a plot uh, showing our sensitivity for a uh, dark photon to electron positron uh, in run three. And uh, this analysis would also really benefit from being able to identify electrons in HLT1. So in conclusion, uh, Allen is the first implementation of a full software trigger stage on GPUs. Um, LHCB's baseline HLT1 has been implemented on GPUs and we can carry out the uh, baseline physics program. And we continue to optimize and improve Allen um, but maybe even more exciting uh, is that Allen could allow LHCB to expand its run three physics program. Uh, we could uh, hopefully accomplish more than the baseline. And you can see that speeding up HLT1 is not just an incremental improvement, but it allows you to perform additional tasks, which can help you expand the kind of physics you can do. And these improved algorithms can lead to completely overhauled trigger strategies. Um, and on top of all of that, we expect that GPUs will continue to improve before run three begins. So these uh, new possibilities will only continue to expand. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Questions? I would have a question. Go ahead. Hi, this is Andy again speaking. Uh, for the for the propagation which you're running there, are you using a constant field or are you actually loading a field map on the GPU onto the GPU? Uh, between the UT and the sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a uh, parameterization. It's a parameterization. Yeah. So we were discussing l lately that on the GPU there's actually uh, that there should be uh, dedicated interpolation. Uh, um, algorithms that would be uh, extremely uh, efficient on uh, on it so one could also envision that to see whether whether one can do a field map which is interpolated on the on the gpu right mm, yeah yeah ah, interesting interesting yeah. so yeah, sorry, sorry. The, field is, the field is inter, the field is in uh, parameterized or the propagation is parameterized? The, the propagation is parameterized ah right okay yeah. Which then makes it easier to have uh, uh, roughly shared. Uh, otherwise, you would have to, to deal with some shared memory uh, between the, uh, the the kernels that, uh, or or ship the field into each kernel, which also is not right. ideal. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, then 
Let's thank you again, Thomas. All right, thank you. And thanks to all the speakers of this session. This was the first virtual session of the CTD conference. I think it went reasonably well. And uh, I hope we see many or all of you at the discussion sessions and in many of the other, uh, the other recording sessions. Thanks a lot for sharing, Michelle.